Okay, very good morning and a very Merry Christmas. It's 20th of December, Friday. Uh, briefing for this morning, not really too much for me to talk about, to be honest. Uh, from a news perspective, this is quite typical for this time of year. Things are, are pretty quiet, so a little bit of a review of the stock market movement, record all-time high again yesterday. Uh, and so Trump certainly delivering that Christmas cheer and the usual seasonal kind of Santa Claus rally. Um, like yesterday, the Dow finished up 137 odd points. Uh, and just having a look at the, the graphic to the side of me at the moment, this is looking at the, the kind of bull run of the US equity market, specifically the S&P 500, looking at the annual price gain. Uh, and as you can see, 2019, despite the big macro risks that have always been present dangers, if you like, for markets, like the escalation of the trade war, uh, significant risks of a global slowdown, the inversion of the yield curve that we had, which has obviously taken a steep reversal since we saw that in around August, September time. 2019, equity performance wise, you know, we're clocking over 25%, up to around 28% on the year. And actually, if you look back over the course of uh, really the last 10 years, that's the second best performing performance that the S&P's put in. Almost the, the worse it gets, the more we think central banks are going to reverse course for the first time in best part really of a decade since the depths of the financial crisis and kind of reversal and looking at the year as a whole with the Fed doing three rate cuts. You know, if you think about the RBA, uh, the RBNZ all doing the same to the same degree. Uh, renewed now quantitative easing in Europe and the ECB and of course Trump looking to get this last minute phase one deal over the line getting a, a good seasonal timing of course uh, for a stock market rally into year end so yeah I just wanted to, to put it into a bit of context obviously a, a stark difference from where we were this time last year if you remember December was an absolute bloodbath epitomized by literally Christmas and Boxing Day, I think, is when we hit that inevitable low, uh, which then was counteracted, obviously, by the biggest rally we've had in the best part of three decades at the beginning of 2019. So, yeah, so different from this time last year. Uh, but looking at the charts this morning, as I said, at the moment, things pretty quiet. I mean, if I look at the S&P 500, it's just come off a touch and uh, pretty sideways during the Asia-Pacific session. This is the centre-right chart and don't really think it's too surprising given the rally and push higher that we had yesterday uh, and so you know global index futures pretty flat overall the DAX basically unchanged uh, also same in the euro stocks despite a little bit of fluctuation as per normal at the at the cash open a short while ago gold pretty sideways just hugging pivot similar to the US 10-year both are down slightly uh, just given some of this, the general correlations with the equity market being relatively firm at these levels gold down about two and a half bucks the 10-year down about seven at the moment it does come as well with you know yields being at levels we haven't seen for multiple months uh, so finishing the year uh, in a very different perspective about people's fears uh, about the near term uh, comparative to where we were at the end of the summer for sure uh, but with that I'm not going to talk too much broad brush, brush about the outlook because Piers and I, Piers, uh, if anyone doesn't know, is our Amplifier's head of trading. Uh, he and I are going to do our outlook for 2020 at 3 p.m. London time this afternoon. Uh, we, we will record that session as well and make it available thereafter. But we're going to talk probably for about 45 minutes or so over some of the key themes like the outcome for Brexit and its implications of the pound. Can we sustain a continued move higher in US equities? Can OPEC continue to underline support for crude oil prices with their production cuts? Uh, and can the ECB and new president Christine Lagarde uh, mitigate the ongoing downturn being experienced in the Eurozone? So they're the four factors we're gonna discuss and I'm gonna put Piers on the spot, get some year end calls uh, and what he thinks the catalyst will be and the real pivot points of, of, of macro and price action uh, over next year. So, so that'll be later on this afternoon. But as I said, overall this morning, things uh, fairly muted. Thing that has been obviously in the press, Boris Johnson 
uh, just going in to the Christmas period he's obviously trying to rush everything through in order to wrap Brexit up for Christmas is what he said yesterday uh, almost like a Trumpism if you like and he well the process he needs to go through is the bill his Brexit bill which we know has been kind of strengthened on uh, the kind of the, the idea of non agreement to transition for an extended period looking to put a bit of pressure on from the negotiation with getting a European deal sooner the better uh, but this obviously creeps in then the renewed risk of a, of a no deal Brexit and, and that's what we've been seeing influencing the, the British pound um, so what's happening today is it's the first vote in the House of Commons looking to push through that legislation obviously to execute that and that delivery of the the initial exit on the 31st of January that being the exit when I say exit I mean the article 50 is going to implementation uh, the vote is going to happen around 2.30 uh, London time this afternoon but likely to be uh, a formality of sorts given now the 80 majority that he's managed to capture from the, the recent UK election uh, the legislation then will be set to go through various stages of progress that uh, the way the UK system works uh, that's going to recommence then in January on the 7th, 8th and 9th. So I, don't, I wouldn't be looking for any type of market reaction, to be honest, from what we'll see this afternoon. It should go through. All of the MPs of which have now um, in the Conservative Party have seats within the lower House of Commons have all said they would back the deal. So no real issues foreseen then. Uh, and then no real issues either really foreseen for when it comes back to the, the various stages of approval. The real problems, if he's going to a counter, happen thereafter, of course. Um, now, just having a look quickly at the sterling chart here. Let me put it back on a, on a 60 minute candlestick. Just wanted to bring in some of the price action that we've had, of course. Um, this time last week, I was quite tired because we'd been up all night uh, delivering the UK election of course and and yeah we're, we are lower now than where we were before the, the gap up obviously on the back of the, the Tory majority so all of that and some has been taken back uh, and we trade really now a well, around 130.50 uh, so a decent kind of four and a half points off where we were on those initial peak that was seen when some of those northern heartlands uh, for Labour turned blue uh, and we hit that kind of 135.50. So yeah, best point of, best part of about five point move there that we've had in Sterling. On a bigger picture, um, this is just looking at cable on a much bigger time frame um, and looking at some of the, well, if I put it like that first to give you a bit of context, this is the trend line uh, from 2014, 2018, 20, uh, and and what we've had in 2019 with the uh, the gap up and break through then of what was the the election, we've come back down to that trend line. It came up and tested it uh, only a few days ago before then coming back down to a fairly significant, at least near term level of um, support. So whether or not the price has the appetite at this time of year to really break through that or not is really yet to be seen but you can see that was the the area of resistance in mid-october uh, but any move further down there's a couple of interesting points probably to keep an eye on that double top that was really the 18th of november so a month on from that area of resistance and support that we're trading at, at the moment uh, that's really the 130 handle as well uh, and then that opens up a, a slightly more deeper move if that were to happen which would be a push down to around 128.33. So obviously this isn't going to happen today or in fact probably for the rest of 2019. But this is if this uh, situation continues to develop as it has been. We had things like UK retail sales, of course, yesterday, which was particularly disappointing. Um, so as the economic slowdown continues, in addition, really, until we get to February, March, when then it's like, you know, we revisit the situation has he got a deal or not and what are the prospects of that happening uh, he's probably going to remain steadfast for as long as he can to keep that narrative ticking along and the more that happens and the lack of progression that I'm anticipating will happen the more downside pressure we're going to get 
and the more we move back down again. Uh, and these would be the subsequent targets then thereafter, 128.33, then 126.30, uh, and so on, until the inevitable extension comes, uh, which I still think is going to happen. Uh, the other thing over that time period, of course, um, that you're going to have to be aware of is Mark Carney. Obviously, Boris has 31st of Jan very much as his date to deliver, as he would call it, delivering Brexit. Um, and Mark Carney leaves. And obviously, this is quite a, a significant change because he's, he's rolled over his term multiple times. And so, uh, you know, markets like continuity. And would he or his departure spell any type of danger for markets? But the answer to that is probably not because the FT have leaked it. Uh, and it seems that this is just going to be ratified later on today, probably by either the Chancellor or the Treasury normally. Uh, but Andrew Bailey, this chap here on my screen, uh, the head of the Financial Conduct Authority, has been selected as a new governor of the Bank of England, according to the Financial Times last night. Um, now, a couple things here. Um, Mr. Bailey does have a little bit of a sketchy past in terms of his performance related to a series of financial scandals in recent years and questions about the effectiveness of the FCA and his oversight. However, he is also a former deputy governor of the Bank of England. So he's definitely equipped in a sense of he knows the routine. Uh, market um, practitioners are very familiar with him. Uh, and, you know, he's even though he's had let's say, uh, a number of mistakes in terms of his time at the FCA, um, he's now leaving that and now he's focusing on monetary policy. And when he was a deputy governor, I can't remember uh, in my mind or recall any time where he said anything out of turn, made any particular large mistakes uh, when he was acting as a deputy. So as far as I would see his appointment, I'd say this is kind of the... The Conservative pick, there was obviously a lot of pressure on the Bank of England to potentially pick a woman for the first time in its entire history, which goes back multiple hundreds of years. They've decided to just basically go for the uh, the recycle of the usual type of suspect. And so for markets, I would say this is probably uh, a good thing in a sense of it's not going to be a disruptive factor for the pound in that transitional period at the end of January into February, I would say. Um, looking at the calendar, what is there to come? There is UK GDP, and I've not really touched upon that much because these are final readings. And remember, we're about to turn into January of 2020. These are GDP readings for Q3 of this year. So it's three months out of date now, and markets are very much, you know, where do we go from here? What we really need to know is it's that, that kind of end of Q1 growth forecasting and performance is what's going to be really key, I think. So looking at GDP for Q3, I wouldn't really look for much in the way of reaction or over interpretation of that data today, certainly from a, any policy implication. Um, that's expected to remain unrevised. It's a final reading. So 0.3% on a quarter, 1% on the year on year. Uh, and then from the US, we get the same. US GDP uh, expected to be unrevised at 2.1%. So you remember a little bit of an upside surprise in the preliminary figure, keeping US growth fairly constant around that 2% level. Surprisingly, a little string of stronger than expected economic surprises from the data sets that we've had from America uh, of late, epitomized by non-farm payrolls, has managed to secure then a, a fairly decent performance for, for growth, despite people getting very pessimistic about uh, growth conditions there. Uh, Canada, retail sales, and then we go back to the States for core PCE price index, uh, personal income data, University of Michigan, but again, this is final reading. Uh, the consumer confidence coming out of the Eurozone is really a non-market moving event. Not sure why that would be bolded, to be quite frank. And then from a speaker's point of view, you do have a Bank of England member uh, and potentially interesting because Haskell is a dissenter. Remember, 7-2 has been the composition of the vote split of late from the Bank of England and Haskell and Saunders have been those two characters. So we're interested to see what Haskell has to say, speaking at 11 a.m. Uh, and then, don't forget, you do have the uh, futures 
options for single stock and index expiration. So this is called quadruple witching. Uh, it's all happening today, which does then typically lead to uh, increased volume volatility at around toward the period of the expiration. So do be aware of that, particularly at the New York Stock Exchange open. Could see, uh, even though it's always quite volatile at the open, perhaps even more erratic today given quadruple witching. And then you've got the expirations as well fading in if you're trading those UK European uh, equity index futures. So the FTSE 1015, Eurostox 11, DAX at 12, uh, trying to think CAC is at three, I think. So uh, just pop me a, a question in the chat if there's any questions on that. All right, that is it from me. I will hand you over to Sam and I will speak to you later for the outlook at 3 p.m when I'll be back on the mic with uh, Piers Curran. Thanks very much. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Santa. Um, delivered the rally as usual in Christmas and S&P. Dow Jones, Nasdaq making all-time highs again last night. 32, what did we get to around the top there? Yeah, almost 32.14. So it seems as though we have broken out that range. And actually, just having a, a quick look at here, we've, we've put a, a bit of a rectangle on that 3200. Um, we had a bit of a retest on that R1 as it came back down uh, on the break. So that was a, a decent opportunity to tee into the back end of, of the session. I'd still have that marked up really today. I think if we were to come back down to that point with the low volume, you'd expect it to hold. So yeah, 3203, 3200 is, is a sort of solid enough area uh, for a point to, to buy, you would suggest, and obviously below that, that lower part of the range, unless that was to go, you'd feel pretty comfortable still holding this market, especially as the volume um, slows down. And it really, I, I tweeted ages ago, but it really does remind me of 2017, December into 18. If we have a quick look back at that, here you can see just those those grinds higher. Yes, a couple of, of down days, nowhere near as big as what we've seen this year, uh, but you can see just grinding, 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 and then quarter one, uh, we saw obviously a big correction. Are we going to see that this year? Or well, next year, I should say. Uh, time will tell, but yeah, for now, you've got to be you've got to be happy holding uh, this this uh, position to the upside. And in intraday, you're happy to, I would say, look for points to, to get in around 3203. If you look at where we've just come down from, is there an opportunity with a break of a trend? Well, I'd start to get a, one of those on. Um, it's not really respected as of yet. But if we were to get maybe the third test up there and also a break of you know some of that Asian session high, uh, then it could be a decent enough opportunity. Having a look over at gold, which we were saying yesterday morning, I like the look of um, a long above 90. Can't quite get there just yet. 14.87, uh, 88 to, to be more precise. So if we can get above there, I like the, the look of a long. Um, and of course to the downside if we were to break any of those those trend lines that started on the the 12th of november uh, then i'd like a short but that seems uh, a while away yet we are now if we put this back to the 60 minute perhaps in a, a smaller range than one to, to keep an eye on here to the upside we hit it again yesterday just failing to to close above and then to the downside yes we spiked below there on wednesday but we're still uh, in in that sort of area so yeah, just pushing below the pivot, but uh, I wouldn't get too excited unless we break out of that. And then more importantly, the 1487, 88, 89, 90 region. Uh, but if we break yesterday's low, you know, that trend line could be slightly more interesting. However, it has been very range bound uh, today. We'd expect a bit of support just a bit below where we're trading, 1480. Uh, and then uh, we would look to, if that doesn't hold, S1 would be the, the sort of target point. We haven't got the trend line in play as of yet, but from the low of the week to the low of yesterday, you can start to see where that might offer an area where people uh, look to get in and take some profit. Just having a look at this now as well, you can see from the high that we had back on the 17th to the 18th, broke through, found support once and again twice now. You can see the market respecting that, so worth having on, and that's of course along with a previous high. So key, key level of support there for gold even in this early hour. Uh, let's move over to Euro, uh, which has just continued this drift lower. Uh, that trend line that broke from the, the low of December. Let's just get that on again. You can see 
we uh, we came back to test it yesterday, albeit choppily, which you know it's, it's understandable that the R1 and and some resistance from what would have been the morning of uh, of Wednesday acted great, uh, and we have come back lower since then. We'd have a trend line from the 70 to that high just above the pivot, again marking up with some resistance from yesterday is a good point perhaps to. Uh, for this, if the market was to push higher for the sellers to come back in again. The low of today is the low that we had back on Wednesday as well, key level uh, and even below there. We wouldn't get too excited just because you go then start coming in the low yesterday, the 12th, and even the highs that we had back on the, the 11th and 10th. So quite a lot of support. Do we close the week below there? That would be key and I would then expect a, a further week uh, to the downside but for now really key point uh, of support you can just see make sure it's above the camera here going back for the 10th of the month to, to where we are now solid base uh, have a look over the, the, the pound and as I mentioned it's below where we were last week which is just remarkable really um, I mean to the to the high it's 500 pips lower which is is baffling uh, if you were to have told me that Friday morning, but uh, yeah, big move lower. Um, saw on Twitter last night a few people think this is a, a great place to get in to, to go long. Uh, we're currently trading on, on the levels not seen since the 3rd of December, uh, which is also mm -hmm. the high uh, on the uh, this new March contract from the 18th of November. So it is a good technical level, but there has been others like the 12th low that didn't quite hold up. So. If you're of the view that there's still a bit more downside to come, 31 handle looks quite good. You've got the low there of the 18th and then the 12th as well, that key level that we did break through. The, the classic short of that once we got a confirmed break below was, was a great trade. Uh, and before there, you would be looking really at, at the pivot point. As with markets that are in a bit of a trend, it's always nice to uh, have those trend lines on. So for example here, yesterday's low in the pound, marking up with the low of last night almost reached it today for that trend but an opportunity could well be on the break of that and when the pound may to uh, the end of the summer was going down these patterns were just you know so good to, to have on, on on the breaks of those trends so that's something I would look to to have marked up there quick look over the other currency pairs Aussie dollar not doing too much this morning but I had found support on what was uh, yesterday uh, sort of afternoons no mornings uh, high we came back in the early hours uh, to find support there in a bit of a new range you would argue with the the highs that we had back on the the 16th uh, of this week uh, so can we break either way will be key couple of trend lines as well you'd look to have on that have been well respected from the 18th to that evening and then yesterday afternoons low uh, as well there the yen yesterday and this is yen against the dollar had a decent push all day really until uh, we got to around 7 o'clock and it almost reached what was such a, a key point. You can see here so much resistance here from the 12th and the 13th didn't quite make that. Today that marks up with the R1 for a bit of a range trade. I think that's uh, the preferable option here. Uh, but to be fair, on a low volume day, S1 also uh, with yesterday's lows and the lows of the 16th and 13th looks like a, a not a bad uh, idea to, to look to get in uh, on that. Oil yesterday spiked higher really uh, decent push looks like it was going to continue and continue before just drifting lower into the back end of the session uh, as with oil and other markets you can see when we're starting just to, to trend here we look to have some of these trend lines on and over the last few days you can see we've certainly respected this one quite nicely uh, so it would remain bullish I guess if we stay above that and then the $61 handle was in the mix there uh, as well for this market in which has just drifted you can see in the mornings into the early afternoon each week before the back end of the session we have come down one two three days in a row that it has done that uh, as with Friday uh, it could always be a relatively quiet one I don't imagine too many people are gonna uh, you know be be in shall we say especially ahead of Christmas but calendar you've got the GDP Q3 reading from the UK uh, to keep an eye on um, and then the final reading GDP from the US retail sales at the, the Canada and some lower tier US data as well so there is some data that could move things however I reckon it's going to be relatively quiet no overall fundamental change in market so I would look for a bit of a continuation uh, in things from optimal levels hope you all have a, a good trading day we'll catch you in the chat for Ant and Piers 
2020 outlook. Uh, and I hope you all have a, a good day.